1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I will invite you at the church and you who are watching on, on the internet to, to remember that Chapter 13 is really like one thought process that goes with 12 and 14. But too often because chapter 13 is such a beautiful chapter and it's on Valentine's cards and everything else, it's this beautiful poem about love that we are t tempted to forget that it's in the midst of these other subjects that Paul's talking about. And it's in the midst of it. Sit down. What I was going to invite you to do is just to sometime in the next few days while it's on your mind, read 12, 13, and 14 together. And it, it makes more sense than it does when we just divide it up week about. Because remember, they were having factions, divisions in their church. And they were having all this trouble. And one of the things that they were, they were puffed up, they were arrogant, they were proud about, uh, it's kind of ironic that they were proud about gifts. <laughs> you don't do anything but receive the gift, but... Uh, they were like, my gift's better than your gift. That sounds like little children, don't it? <laughs> and Paul goes on, and what chapter 13 is about, and I'm going to give away right up front, it's about this. He's like, I'm going to paraphrase chapter 13. I don't care what kind of gift you have. It's a gift of God, and if it ain't motivated by love, it's useless. That just summed up chapter 13. So here we go. He's been talking about the, the gifts, and as we finish chapter 12, but you got to read the verse 31 of chapter 12 before you go into 13 because it puts it all together. When he's been talking about all the gifts and he names all kinds of gifts and not everybody's got the same gift. People's got different gifts and they're for building up the church. And then he says, but covet or desire earnestly the best gifts. And yet I show you unto you a more excellent way. He's like, here's the best way yet. And it's about loving God and loving your neighbors. So chapter 13, we're going to get started now. Verse 1. Though I, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I have not charity, the old 1611 King James says, but I may read through here and call it love because we think of charity in a different way now. We think of charity sometimes now that you're given to something. But, as like, but, but that is a form of charity. It's a form of love. And, and it, most of the newer translations, I think, just translate it love. So I'm going to read it that way when I come to charity in the 1611. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And that's a poetic way of saying I ain't nothing but a bunch of noise if there ain't love involved with it. I can stand up and I can speak in tongues and I can do this and all kinds of stuff. But if it ain't, if it ain't motivated by love, he said, it's just noise. To God. <laughs> and though I have the gift of prophecy, speaking on behalf of God, and, and understand all mysteries, if I understood all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I'm nothing. A zero with the rim knocked off. I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my, you know, these are the examples Paul's doing. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I, if I, if I become a martyr, though I give my body to be burned, and, and I have not love, it profits me nothing. It don't do me one bit of good. Nothing. Verse 4 says, love suffers long. I'd paraphrase it this way. Love puts up with a whole lot of stuff. And he's going to say that three different ways in the next few verses. Love puts up with a lot. Love is kind. Love envies not. That kind rung a bell. I, I mailed the newsletter today. If you're on the newsletter list, and the, I used the verse in the pastors that be kind to one another. And I made the point that if you haven't noticed, everybody is on edge right now because everybody in the world is mad. We're tired of this virus. I'm mad at it, and some people are depressed about it, and maybe all of us are depressed a little bit because our freedom's been taken away. But depression is really just another form of anger. So remember that everybody you come in contact with, is, their fuse is a little bit shorter than it was a year ago. So be kind to one another. 
Love's kind. Love envies not. Verse 4. Love vaunteth not itself. Love's not puffed up. Which is the reason these original recipients of the letter were having problems. They were puffed up about their gifts. They were puffed up looking down their noses at somebody that had different gifts than them. Verse 5. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Remember the early chapters, first thing you dealt with, they had a couple different sex scandals going on. Love seeks not her own. Love is not easily provoked, which is the second way of saying love puts up with a whole lot. Love thinks no evil. It thinks the best. <laughs> love rejoices not in sin, and hearing about others' sin and iniquity. But love rejoices in the truth. The Bible says, thy word is truth. Verse 7 says, love bears all things. That's the third way of saying love puts up with a whole lot. Love believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Might be another way of saying puts up with a lot. Love never fails. But now remember what they were so excited about and puffed up about and bragging about and looking down on their neighbors about their gifts, right? So here he's going to get into the gifts again. He says, now love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. And, and that's not the prophecies that are found in our Bible. That means if somebody was prophesying something and it failed, that was a man-made prophecy. He said, They're going, that's going to happen. That wasn't God. That was man. And whether there be tongues, they'll cease. We sing a song, uh, I believe it's how far my foundation, that's got a line in it that uh, says, uh, when this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, tongues they'll cease. Well, there'll be knowledge, it'll vanish away. I told Harold and Kenny on the porch a while ago, we were trying to remember things, and I was thinking, uh, I think I've got more in my head than I've ever had in my life, but I've noticed the retrievers getting longer and longer. Sometimes I, I know the answer to something, and I'll tell somebody, I'll tell you after a while, because sometimes it'll take an hour or two to come out, and, oh yeah, that's what that person's name was or whatever. Knowledge, it'll vanish away, though. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Now I'm going to put 9 and 10 together here. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, ultimately, I think Paul's probably talking about when the Lord comes back. But another way of looking at this, too, is they didn't have the Bible like we've got yet in the first century. And what they're hearing from the Lord is often coming through somebody speaking in tongues and somebody interpreting, saying, Thus saith the Lord. So they're prophesying in parts. But when that which is perfect is come, and some translations say that which is complete is come, same word in the Greek translates perfect or translates complete, then that which is in part shall be done away with. And you could argue that we have the complete word of God, what God's wanted us to have in the canon's clothes now. So we don't have to prophesy in parts because it's in the books now. When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. And then his illustration is, his very personal one, but I think he's going to apply it to the mid-first century church, which was in the childish age of the faith because they didn't have the Bible yet. When I was a child, he said, I spake as a child and I understood as a child and I thought as a child, but when I become a man, when I grew up, I put away childish things. For now, and this fits for now when we live too, but it also fit for a first century church that didn't have a Bible yet. They were getting letters from Paul and they were prophesying bit, bits and parts. And they could see through the mirror darkly, through a foggy mirror. I, I could see through a glass darkly. But then, when that which is perfect and complete comes, we'll see face to face. Ultimately, that's Jesus, I think. But now I know in part. But then shall I know even as I'm known. Or I'll know God the way he knows me. And now, here, here's an astounding verse, 13, 13 of 1 Corinthians. And now, we've got these three things, faith, hope, and love. 
Now by faith, hope, and love, these three. But then an astounding thing is said by a preacher, <laughs> inspired by the Holy Ghost of God. But the greatest of them three things, greater than faith and greater than hope, is love. Now they probably had a lot of faith and a lot of hope here. And Paul said, what you're lacking in with all these schisms and divisions and arrogance and fighting and fussing over the over the gifts and all this stuff. What you, what you need is the greatest. Or Henry Drummond, centuries ago, I think, wrote a little old book that's uh, circulated still today. It's called, the title of it is The Greatest Thing in the World. And it's based on this verse. The greatest thing in the world is love. And he say, well, you'd think Paul, being the preacher that he was, would have said, you know, there's nothing greater than faith. You can't get to heaven without faith. Well, that's a true statement. Faith in the gospel. But yet, one of these days, Christians, we are going to get to heaven. And we're not going to have to practice faith when we get to heaven because we'll see face to face then. We won't have to practice hope when we get to heaven because the Bible says, why would you hope for what has been attained? When we're there, there's nothing left to hope for. Our hopes have been realized. But the thing that will be eternal that begins in this life and is in its fullest in the next life is love. I think that's why he said love is the greatest of all three of them. Lord, we do thank you for faith and hope. We thank you for the greatest thing in the world, love. It was love that motivated your heart, but we can't even understand it. As Paul said, who can comprehend the love of God? But Lord, you've told us that it was love that sent Jesus, for you so loved the world. And we know that it was love that kept him nailed to that cross because he could have called legions of angels and took him down and went back to heaven, the sinless Son of God. And Lord, we thank you that the Bible teaches us that we love you because you first loved us. Help us to reciprocate that love of God back to you and to share it with other people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs> All right, next week, before you turn us off right here, next week is important. We're going to get into the, these gifts again. But remember, right in the middle of it, he said, ain't none of it worth nothing if it ain't under undercarried with love. So we'll talk about the tongues and all that stuff in chapter 14 next week. See you next week.